or is that awkward 30 <laughs> seconds or minute when you're launching everyone comes in and everyone who's been watching is like these people are so serious and saying <laughs> absolutely nothing <laughs> just slightly worried looking faces I'll just uh, I'll start talking so people know that uh, we're having all frozen. Um, so hello everybody that's, that's coming in. Um, my name's Jack. I'm the chair of the Young Fabians Environment Network for this year. Thanks everybody for joining us for our launch of our report on climate change accountability. The original intention was to launch this report just before the United Nations COP26, which I'm sure most of you know is due to take place um, in November of this year in Glasgow. Um, obviously, uh, no guesses, uh, no, no prizes for guessing why, but that meeting's obviously been delayed to 2021. Uh, but we decided in the Young Fabians to continue with our work and continue with the report. Uh, we know that climate change is still a massive priority. Um, you know, just in the last couple of weeks in the news, I've been reading articles um, about permafrost in Siberia thawing for the first time in new areas, uh, the so-called doomsday glacier. Uh, in Antarctica that is melting more rapidly than previously thought. Um, of course, we've all seen major fires on the American West Coast. Um, and only this morning, I was reading fresh uh, analysis about tipping points uh, and how even a 1.5 degree uh, rise higher than pre-industrial levels uh, of global heating could become uncontrollable. And of course, we're already at 1.1, so 1.5 does not feel too far away. Um, the media is understandably focused on health and the economy right now, but that does not mean that climate change has paused. Uh, it is still relentless and accelerating, and the warning signs are flashing more than ever. So thank you to all of our authors and researchers for our report, which we're launching today. Um, in particular, I want to thank Cecilia and Laura, who helped me edit and compile the report, spending many hours scrolling through, looking for typos and commas that should be bullet points and bullets that should be commas. Um, so thanks for them. Uh, the link to the report is in the chat function. Uh, there's a link there at the top, which has got the uh, PDF, which we just finished literally yesterday. So to outline the plan for the next hour or so, um, we're very lucky to have here two members of parliament. So we have Matt Pennycook, the Shadow Minister for Climate Change. Uh, he actually wrote the forward for a report. So thanks again, Matt, for that. Uh, and we're also joined by Kerry McCarthy, MP, who's our Shadow Minister for Green Transport. So we'll be hearing from both of them in just a minute. Um, we'll obviously do some Q&A with those two members of Parliament, so please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom uh, to throw in your questions, and we'll be picking out some of those. And then in the second half of the session, we'll be hearing from some of our authors from the report who will give a quick two-minute summary of their chapters, um, and we'll close with a, a shorter Q&A period for our authors as well. So without further ado, um, I will pass first of all on to uh, Matthew Pennycook, our Shadow Minister for Climate Change. Thanks Jack and thanks for having me on the call and uh, congratulations to Cecilia Law and, and all the authors and everyone else involved in pulling this report together. I think it's a really timely report uh, and in part does what we need to do and I hope we'll speak about which, which is how we get the public and uh, the Labour movement to really start to do what's necessary so that COP26 is seen as that critical moment that it will be. I'm sure I didn't, don't need to tell most people on the, the, this call that climate crisis is, in a sense, the existential challenge facing our country and the world uh, and will be with us long after the coronavirus has passed. Jack mentioned some of the uh, weather-related events we're seeing all around the world. The worst wildfires in US history, simultaneous hurricanes in the Atlantic, Greenland's ice shelf melting beyond uh, the point of no return, and the hottest summer in the Northern Hemisphere since records began. And all of this, as Jack said, is at a world that is one degree uh, hotter than pre-industrial levels. And as we all know, where the world is currently on course for somewhere between three and four degrees. And three and four degrees is not just three to four times worse than what we have now. Um, in many ways, it's significantly worse for every fraction of a degree you go higher. This is a problem entirely of our own making, um, and it is incontrovertible that the world is not doing enough to tackle it. And I'd argue that our government is not doing enough in terms of what the UK's contribution needs to be to tackle it. As the IPCC made clear in their landmark 1.5 degree report, what we require in particular in this crucial decade is far reaching and unprecedented changes 
in all aspects of society, i.e. system change. We can't have tinkering around the edges uh, and we can't have climate action at the pace and scale which is currently taking place in this and other countries. And really this is a collective action problem. As much as individual behaviour can make a difference, it's important. What we saw in the pandemic is actually for all the human, social and economic cost of the virus, emissions only fell by just over two thirds of what is required each and every year to hold global heating to below 1.5 degrees. So that gives you a sense of, of, you know, in a sense, it can't just be temporary blips. This has got to be system change. This has got to be transforming the way we do uh, everything uh, and the way we live our lives. In terms of COP26, it is a critical moment in the fight against runaway global heating, as I wrote in the foreword because it's the first conference after Paris where the ratchet mechanism, which is designed, those provisions which are designed for all countries to increase their ambition, it is, comes into play. And so what we need above all else, there are lots of um, tests there will be at COP26 in terms of what needs to be negotiated, rules around markets and transparency, uh, progress on finance, uh, further progress on loss and damage. But the, the most important thing is raising significantly the ambition of all countries that are participating. Um, and that ambition needs to be raised drastically. Current country commitments under Paris uh, would see the world emitting around 54 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in 2030. Now, two degrees of warming would require emissions to be around 41 gigatons and 1.5 degree emissions would require them to be around 24 gigatons. So if we're talking about trying to hold the world to 1.5, which is I think what must be our aim, the ambition gap, if you like, is somewhere around 30 gigatons. And that is huge. And it's being entirely candid, very unlikely that at COP next year we'll see pledges that get us near that ambition gap, but that still must be our aim. And geopolitical headwinds aside, the UK has, a, has an incredibly important role to play as the host. And this is where I don't think that we're doing enough. I think, um, and Kerry may expand on this, I think the government took on COP26 for, if we're honest, reasons that are entirely almost unrelated to climate change. I think it wanted to, I think it thought it could have it as an easy showcase for global Britain. I think it was responding to political pressure in, in terms of that wave of activism we saw last year. But it certainly wasn't because they wanted to, I think, drive the world's ambition in this area necessarily as a primary reason for taking it. And I think in many ways the government are realising that they've bitten off more than they can chew. But despite that, and despite I think the greater sense increasingly of what they, they've got to do, I think the performance of our government in terms of preparing for COP is falling um, uh, woefully short. And, and there are three, you know, and we will talk about this further I'm sure, there are three areas there are, there are many others, but there are three areas I'm going to pick out which I think we need to see real progress on. Uh, the first is domestic ambition. I think the important thing, and again I stress this in the forward, the important thing about COP26 is it's quite unlike Paris in that uh, lots of the issues uh, that will be decided and in, which, in, in many ways in which the world will judge whether it's been a success or failure, although I don't like the I don't like to use in terms of COP the language of success. I think sometimes it can be unhelpful to judge them in that basis because there's going to be many, many more after this but how it will be judged will be in part around those country climate ambitions and those will be negotiated in capitals around the world long before delegates ever get to glasgow next year and that is where we've got to see our country leading the way in terms of its domestic ambition and we can talk about this but we all know that we're off course uh, not only for net zero but the previous less stringent targets we had in place under the climate change act we're not seeing from the government when it comes to green recovery for example which they are nominally committed to in rhetoric at least anything like the level of ambition which countries like france germany or a biden administration in the us for uh, for that case would show so we need to see much more for our government um towards uh, the remaining months of this year if you like i think the spending review in the budget will be critical and then the sick carbon budget after that for setting what what is our climate plan our ndc going into that but we need got to see much much more domestic ambition. On, at the same time, I think we've got to see alongside that domestic ambition, and, and, and that can be manifested in many, many ways. Me and Kerry did a letter just this week about where that ambition needs to come out on, for example, the phase out of petrol, diesel and hybrid vehicles. But alongside that domestic ambition, we've got to see, I think, more focus 
on our consistency and credibility abroad in terms of uh, in terms of foreign policy and one example of that is the financing of fossil fuel projects overseas we've been pressing the government to phase those out completely and not to have any loopholes if they do and we hopefully are going to see some uh, progress on that i would hope in the coming weeks but that's just one example of where what the uk is doing overseas is not commensurate with its leadership role as the host of COP. So I think we need some credibility abroad. And the last point I throw out there, and I think this is really important, is got to be a greater focus. And partly this is in how the government talks about COP, because at the moment, the way it's talking about COP and what it sees as success are some very, very small and focused tests around specific policy areas. There needs to be a wider narrative. And, and, and one aspect of that narrative has got to be what we in the developed world have to do to support more vulnerable countries uh, around the world that are the, the sharp end of, of, of climate breakdown. And I think we're not seeing that, and that is part and parcel of, I think, the lack of a diplomatic effort that is anywhere on the scale in terms of government's priority for, compared to what the French were doing um, before Paris uh, in 2015, for example. So I think that's got to be a big part of the narrative. Jack, I'll finish it there. I hope there's lots of questions that come in. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, and be good to hear what Kerry has to say as well there. You want me to just start talking? Okay. Um, thanks, thanks for that, Matthew. Um, I, I'm going to preface what I'm saying um, with a strict caveat that um, Matthew has the shadow climate change brief. I've now got shadow green transport. Um, before I was appointed to that post in April, I was on the Environmental Audit Committee and the, um, the EFRA Committee, and also on the Environment Bill Committee and the Agriculture Bill Committee. So quite a lot of what I'm going to say probably stems as much from that experience. I will we'll touch on transport. Um, but the, the caveat is that um, this is very much uh, me throwing ideas out there and responding to some of the things that are in the pamphlet rather than um, uh, being taken as an indication that this is exactly what Labour will be calling for at COP because that's Matt's territory. Um, but I, I'd start by saying I, I like the way the pamphlet sort of acknowledged that we have twin emergencies. There's the ecological crisis as well as the climate change crisis and they're completely interconnected in, in so many ways um, and I think I think to start with it took quite a while to get the ecological emergency on the agenda in the same way but to recognize that interconnectedness um, I, I think it's it's taken quite a while to sort of see those two things as as things that we we tackle them in 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 some ways by the, the same um, measures um, but I think we have got there now and I think it's important that we have um, one of the things that the, the pamphlet touched on in quite some detail, which I think is incredibly important as we approach COP, is how we um, deal with this issue that at the moment we measure our emissions in terms of the country of production, um, which presents a really false picture in terms of what the UK is actually responsible for. Um, there's not much point reducing the carbon footprint of the things that we produce in this country if we're importing a huge number of goods from, say, China with a massive carbon footprint. And, and tied in with that is the question of you know, how we measure international aviation and shipping emissions, which at the moment aren't caught up in the targets. And I think what um, yeah, the pamphlet does talk about deforestation, for example, and, and Matthew touched on that. And again, this is part, it's partly about the carbon footprint of things that we produce, but it's also about the ecological footprint. And we know that the things that, yes, yeah, it's, it's partly the investment, and Matthew mentioned UK export finance and the money that we're putting into fossil fuel projects overseas. Um, we have UK companies, I know that people involved in the pamphlet have been talking to Joe Blackman from Global Witness. We have UK companies that are financing um, directly and indirectly um, through pension funds, through actually supporting, you know, directly giving money to companies involved in deforestation, whether it be cattle ranching or soy production. Um, but we are also complicit in that through our consumption patterns. We are buying um, chicken well I'm not buying chicken fed on that but people you know the, the, the vast majority of the uh, chicken that would be bought in this country would be fed on soya that would be sourced from um, and quite a lot of it would be sourced the, the soy that they're fed on would be sourced from countries where it's connected with deforestation so that link between you know obviously deforestation has a real carbon 
impact in terms of we're losing natural carbon sinks. Um, and while, while we're talking about carbon sinks, I think as well as talking about trees, we also need to be talking about peatlands. And we saw the story today that the government is rowing back on its commitment to stop the burning of peatlands because um, the grouse moor managers have uh, basically got to them about that. But um, uh, peatlands and the ocean, seagrass, other you know natural carbon sinks are really important as well. But obviously, um, you know, we talk about the Amazon being the lungs of the earth. So there's a real imperative from the climate change point of view to stop deforestation, but there's also a real imperative because massive, you know, is one of the most biodiverse places in the world, huge consequences in terms of loss of habitats and the impact on wildlife there as well. So that's what I meant by things being um, connected. I have been working with Jo Blackman and W so in her capacity working for Global Witness and also with WWF on amendments to the Environment Bill. Um, we tried to get an am amendment in about measuring our global footprint, which the Tories voted down. But the amendment that is still, when the bill returns to committee in the autumn, um, there's an amendment try, uh, requiring due diligence from UK companies to audit, measure, and then weed out, you know, uh, remove um, links to deforestation in their supply chains. And the government's responded to that by coming up with a consultation, um, which is basically a consultation on weeding out illegal de deforestation in your supply chains. And my argument would be that when you've got Bolsonaro actually removing a lot of the legal protections for deforestation, it's not just illegal deforestation that's a problem. A lot of the things that are connected to deforestation are um, perfectly legal, but that doesn't mean to say that they are good or moral or um, things that we should be complicit in. Um, I think land use and food, that is mentioned in there, but I think land use both here in this, this country and elsewhere is a massive issue. I'm glad that you talk about the impact, you know, the, the need to look at um, protection for vulnerable countries. I think particularly the small island developing states, they get a mention in there, but um, I, I really want to see that on the agenda when we come to COP and the whole question of loss and damage for those states. So I, I had the, the great fortune to go to Barbados and Grenada just before lockdown. Um, it was a parliamentary delegation. I have to say, I had my arm twisted to go. I wasn't, I wasn't originally gonna go, but um, the whole focus of that trip was um, climate change and environment and a few a few other issues but talking to the minister the environment ministers in those countries they simply without international resources you look at things like rising sea levels you look at the the change in terms of food shortages in the country um, the the need to make the tra transition in terms of energy they can't do any of that without support from the, the western world and um, I think we owe it to them to to be looking at and the, and the the global climate fund at the moment that they can tap into apparently is really difficult for them to access so i think that's something that really needs to be sorted out at cop and the final thing i'll say just because it is my brief is is transport is still responsible for 24 surface transport in this country is responsible for 24 percent of our emissions we've actually been pretty good in terms of reducing um, in terms of energy use and some of the other levers that we can pull. But with transport, we are not making the transition anywhere near as fast as we need to. And as, as Matt said, um, he and I and Alan Whitehead did a letter to Grant Shapps this week saying that if we're serious about this, at the moment, the government's uh, target date for phasing out um, petrol and diesel and hybrid vehicles is 2040. Labour policy is 2030. Um, the government is looking at whether they can bring it forward. But measures like that are absolutely um, imperative if we are going to take net zero seriously. Um, and that's something we'll, we'll continue to push for. And it is part of the green recovery. I think, um, uh, you know, Matt said that the autumn statement from the Chancellor and the support for um, a green, trend, you know, a, a green recovery is incredibly important, whether that be aviation or car manufacturing. I think we are going to offer public money to these sectors to help them through COVID. We ought to make it conditional on them, bringing forward and being more ambitious about their, their green credentials as well. And I will end on that. Great, thank you uh, to Matthew and to Kerry for those um, statements, um, all very interesting points in there. 
Um, so we have a, a, quite a few questions coming in, perhaps to make it a little bit more efficient. Um, I'll give you a couple of questions at a time and you can both come in on whichever point you feel most appropriate. Um, so there's a, there's a question um, asked by an attendee, which is kind of similar to a question I was going to start off with actually, which is around the fact that given the health and the economy are going to dominate, I think, the media, certainly for the next few months and likely through 2021, what can we do in the Labour Party to build that narrative around climate change, um, you know, talk about it holistically in a way that um, emphasises the importance of COP26 to you know, the average UK citizen who perhaps at the moment is not paying too much attention to it. Um, so that's one question. And then we also have a question from uh, Pranav, who's a, one of our attendees, although his microphone's not working. Um, and he was asking um, effectively about the role of courts. Um, he, he mentioned that uh, six young people from Portugal uh, recently uh, filed a climate change lawsuit um, against Europe uh, and several nations, the UK, the US, there's a separate decision in the Supreme Court in Ireland um, in which effectively uh, you know, individuals are struggling to uh, make their points heard in those courts. They're, they're effectively saying that a lot of the decisions made by those governments are against the, the aims of uh, the climate crisis. Um, effectively, the question is, how can we um, you know, embolden the rights of individuals to keep their governments to account through the legal system? Um, Matt, can I come to you on, on those two questions first? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first one, and maybe, because I, I suspect Kerry is, is, is much better placed to talk about the second one, because in a sense, the governance gap around the environment uh, as we uh, post-Brexit post is a particular issue that's been, you know, it's been on our agenda for, for a few years, and the ability of, of, of individuals to seek redress um, um, you know, potentially is much more limited. But but let me let me take the green recovery one, if you like. Um, I think there are two things. One, I think we've got we have to keep trying, although in a sense the narrative has kind of been set on this to to draw the links between um, the environment crisis and the coronavirus, and you know for various reasons, not least our intrusion into to habitats as development around the world continues apace. But I think you know there is a clear link that I think the public, the public do understand at some level, because we've got to start, in a sense, not, I think, looking at the coronavirus as, as you know, the present crisis, and that has to be dealt with before we shift to this one. How we actually deal with the, the coronavirus is, is going to lay the foundations for how much progress is achieved this decade. And what I mean by that is very specifically in terms of a green recovery, that we have this opportunity, despite all the, 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 the hardship, the pain that's come with the pandemic, we are going to have to rebuild off the back of it. There is a, a intrinsically is going to be a stimulus package of some kind brought forward by the government, and we need to make sure it's it's a green one. Um, and as I said, the government are falling really far short of, of what other advanced nations are doing. I mean, if you look at some of the things which other countries are doing, I, I named I think Germany and France in in my opening remarks. Germany, forty billion euros worth. Of, of, of stimulus investment directed at decarbonisation. The French are now up to 30 billion. Biden's promised two trillion over, over a single presidential term uh, uh, aimed in this area. You know, when we look at what our government have done so far, and there's a few pre-pandemic um, measures brought forward, but basically in terms of the green recovery, we're looking at three billion pounds in a one-off energy efficiency package, um, which is actually, and they've made clear on this just this last week, will not be followed year on year. So it's going to fa fall short of the manifesto commitment for just over £9 billion direct in this area. But that doesn't, that, that is, you know, nowhere near the amount we need. You know, there's lots of, we can have a discussion about what kind of, what a green recovery actually means. But part of this is the quantum of investment because of the scale of change that needs to take place. So we've got to be making the argument for, I think, in, in, as we talk about economic recovery from coronavirus, we've got to be talking about it in terms of low carbon infrastructure and job creation on, you know, I don't like the term in a sense because I think voters don't really understand it because it's too abstract, but green jobs essentially. And I think that kind of ties to another point, which is a, an interesting one we can talk about perhaps separately, but I think just generally in terms of trying to put climate up the agenda and cop up the agenda, we've got to not only speak to people who you know, understand and care passionately about the problem or might be pragmatically willing to make changes in their lives to address the problem. We've got to talk about to, to all of those voters out there, to way more than half of the population for whom it's not a priority. 
And actually, you're not going to get to them necessarily by talking about the climate emergency or a just transition or all these other things that we talk about in terms of the conversations with the environment movement. And for them, I think this is where I think Biden, for all the flaws in the plan over there, is, is, is approaching it the right way in that for most people, they're not going to be necessarily interested in that, but they are interested in, in good, well-paying, unionized jobs. And they are interested in investment in their local towns and communities and regions. And I think in a sense, uh, although we've got to establish trust to be able to do this, most of the conversation I think that allows us to break through to, to a wider segment of the public on this is just around uh, you know, making people's communities and their lives better through jobs and investment. And that is certainly how the government is going to approach this. Look at what the government are doing. The, all the government's rhetoric around climate is around innovation, technological progress, and then scorecarding investment on the basis of where it's going to have most effect and for them politically in the seat, some of the seats we've lost. So we've got to start in a sense just building the climate narrative into our general economic narrative, if you like, um, as in the months ahead. And they are really crucial months around this spending review and budget. I'll, I'll answer the second question, but just off the back of that, I would say it's really important that we work with the trade unions on this. So the shadow transport team obviously been talking to Unite in particular a lot about the aviation sector and um, the, the, the need for a, a bailout, for want of a better word, there. And um, it was good that Diana Holland, the Assistant General Secretary there, said, confirmed that they wanted it to be a green recovery. They wanted that link to um, climate change put in there in terms of there were sort of various conditions that were, I think we issued a list of six conditions, which included things like proper protection for jobs, but it was also very much about um, uh, the, the, the climate, climate objectives and the, the role. A aviation won't recover um, in terms of passenger transport till probably like 2023 or so. So at the moment, its, it's emissions are, are obviously much lower than they would have been, but um, eventually things will return back to where they were. And we obviously want to sort of use this opportunity to, to try and address some of those issues in the interim. In terms of the courts, I mean, the courts have been incredibly powerful as a driver of tackling environmental issues. I mean, the uh, I'd say the biggest recent issue was Client Earth taking the government to court several times over its failure to meet European um, air quality standards. And the problem is, and, and, you know, and that has uh, triggered, uh, I, I would say that the government has basically passed the buck to local authorities without the resources to do it, but at least it has forced a government response. Um, with the Environment Bill, um, we're, we're potentially in a, a very dangerous situation. The Environment Bill is meant to be bringing into UK law the environmental protections that, um, that at the moment we, we benefit from as a result of still, yeah, although obviously Brexit's happened, we're still until the end of the transition period subject to the European um, rules. And some like two thirds of our environmental legislation comes from the EU. So it's, it's obviously really important we do this. Um, that bill has to be in place by the end of the transition period, and it's not going to be. It was it was put on hold for Corona. It will be back in, well, we thought, we hoped it would be back in committee as soon as Parliament resumed in September, but um, there's still no sign of it. And it's, it's without going into lots of detail about parliamentary procedure, it's got to go through committee stage in the Commons, report stage in the Commons, then in go, to, go into the House of Lords, where they seem to be able to talk about things forever. Um, with the Agriculture Bill, they just had session after session after session going on for weeks. Um, so that will not be in place by the end of the year. And that establishes an Office of Environmental Protection to enforce these rules. Um, that is going to be based in Bristol. I've heard that they were looking for premises and they might, well, the, the plan was to set up a shadow Office of Environmental Protection before the real thing comes into law. But, you know, it's, it's late September now and there's been no word about that body being established or anyone recruited to, to run it. And that's the danger is that where will the enforcement be if we haven't got a body like the OEP up in there enforcing it? We know the Environment Agency already is, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't blame the Environment Agency, it's because of the sheer lack of resources, but um, we've got the stage where none of our rivers meet the, the clean water um, 
uh, standards at the moment, things like the waste hierarchy, which is meant to be legally enforceable, which means that you, you prevent waste, then you reuse, and then you get to things like, uh, in, in terms of food waste, say anaerobic digestion and so on, and landfill ought to be at the absolute bottom. You know, that's a legal requirement. Environment Agency has never had the resources to prosecute anybody or take any enforcement action when that hierarchy isn't observed. Um, and the other thing I think that's the danger at the moment is the, the relaxation of planning rules. So in the Environment Bill, there are provisions for net gain, which basically means that um, it's a sort of connected to the whole concept of biodiversity offsetting. But it's basically if you, if you do something that causes environmental loss, you've got to compensate for it either on the same site or elsewhere. And my real, I'm, I'm, I'm sceptical, if you look at High Speed 2, for example, which uh, Labour supports High Speed 2, but if you say, look at the loss of ancient woodlands there, that is quite a difficult task, compensating for the loss of those woodlands. It's, a, it's not something you achieve overnight. You have to monitor it decade on decade to make sure that you are getting that net environmental gain. And A, we won't have the Environment Bill in place to ensure that that is happening but also with the relaxation of planning laws it means a lot more developers i think won't be bound by the planning system to actually address some of those issues so um that all sounds a bit yeah i, I suppose in answer to the question about the role of the courts yeah i think organizations like client earth you've got really good organizations like environmental justice foundation as as well um uh, wild justice which was set up by chris packham and others um they're doing good stuff, but unless you've got that regime in place, unless you've got the systems in place, it is going to be very difficult for individuals to, to take action because you've got to have the laws in place in the first place. Perfect, thanks both. Um, to everyone listening, um, I believe that there's some functions of the chat on, on Zoom that have been uh, disabled. So for simplicity, I will just read out the, the questions that are coming in. Um, and Kerry was there touching a little bit on the sort of planning regulations. And we do actually have a question from Celia Wilson, who is a district councillor on a planning committee in Oxfordshire. Uh, and Celia mentions the fact that the government is obviously encouraging more and more building to boost the economy. Um, she feels that there's no requirement to, to build those homes sustainably or even carbon zero neutral or anywhere near it. And those regulations are relaxing month by month. So the question is, um, you know, recognising that we do need more affordable homes and her, obje her objective of building them carbon zero, what can she do now as a councillor? Uh, where, where in the government system can she exert pressure to try and make sure those homes are built um, as sustainably as possible? And I'll add a, another quick question onto that, which is around the fact that obviously uh, the COP UN meeting has been delayed to next year. Um, how do we make sure that we don't lose time? How do we make sure that we make the most of the end of 2020 and, and going to 2021 so that we effectively can you know, achieve two years worth of progress at that next meeting, we don't lose a year? Um, Sorry, come in there, Joe. Yeah, Matt, sure. Um, on, C on Celia's question, I mean, I think there are two things here. One is we, we shouldn't forget that in, in lots of, uh, in lots of uh, towns and communities, lots of local authorities are doing really good work in this area and are producing, if not sort of passive house standard houses, that, then really, really high quality, low carbon housing. So it, so it can be done, although I absolutely take the point that I think Celia is making, which is it's incredibly difficult. And we all know the government's record, zero carbon homes and watering down regulations in this area. Um, I'd say two things. One is Fang Debonair, who's a shadow housing minister. This is a real priority for her, I know, in terms of uh, decarbonising uh, building stock and construction more widely. There is a future home standard consultation quite recently from the government where, you know, from, from what I take from it, it falls far short of what's needed. And I think they're reviewing those consultation responses. So in part, we can con continue to keep the pressure on the government in that specific area. But it's quite, um, I think they've received a lot of submissions, but it's incredibly sort of technical niche area of policy. I think it's building a part L of the building regulation or something where it technically you get into these energy targets and, and carbon targets, but it's really important. So we've got to keep, to keep the pressure on government there. In terms of the COP delay, I actually overall think the COP delay is a good thing. 
in the sense of I think there was a real risk that that um, our government wouldn't have wouldn't have uh, did what it had sorry it wouldn't have done what it needed to do as host by any means to ensure a successful COP had it been taking place in a few months time um, and so I think that delay actually is an opportunity in some places you're right that in a sense you've got to do two years of catching up but that's where I think you know the 13 months we had are a really uh, an opportunity in some ways to ensure that all countries around the world are raising their ambitions significantly and what we haven't seen we haven't seen a huge amount of what are called NDCs these are the national climate plans coming forward we've got to come up with our own now we've less, left the European Union we haven't seen a huge amount of NDCs come forward even though technically they, they should be submitted this year as part of the Paris Agreement we haven't seen that many come forward and those that come forward in, in many cases haven't been as ambitious as we'd have hoped but this is where I come back to I think you know Jack what I said in my opening remark which is I think the UK as the host has a particular responsibility here and what we're calling on the government to do is to publish its NDC publish its climate plan before the end of this year base it on the committee for climate change's six carbon budget advice you know put a significantly enhanced 2030 target in that and let's go out there to the world and say look you know we've got a year but actually COP26 is about in a sense putting the stamp on those greater climate ambition uh, that's decided in particular capitals but let's lead the rest of the world to the extent we can as the host by going out there early with a really ambitious climate plan of our own and then rallying the world to follow suit also by taking action to get our overseas policies consistent and the diplomatic strategy that needs to go along with that but I think we can we can play quite a crucial role in terms of building momentum because that's what's important over those 13 months that we've now got building momentum in terms of coming out there with a big bold plan of our own and we still don't know where the government are with that Alok Sharma was very cagey about whether an NDC um, would would be released this year um, at all rather than early next so I think there's, there's a real this is where us being the host we can sort of really do a lot to ensure it's a success or we can be behind the pace as we are with green recovery um, and then it'll be down to other countries and what they do entirely to 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 see what happens at COP in terms of um, how much ambition comes out of it. So I think you're on mute Kerry. That's it. it so if, if I'm slow in unmuting, it's just because I've had this problem all week that it doesn't like me clicking on the unmute button for some reason. But um, and then you're standing there saying, yes, I know I'm trying to unmute, but nobody can hear me saying it. Um, in the interest of getting more questions in, I'll just say, you know, I, I, I agree with what Matthew was saying. Um, I think on the planning, the uh, there's quite a lot of Tory MPs are quite unhappy with um, what's being suggested because while they're all in favour of developers, being free from red tape and being able to do what they want to do. Um, they're fine with that, they, they like that, it fits in with their ideology. Um, but when it comes to actual development in their own back garden, you know, or in their own neighbourhood, um, they're not so happy with it. So I'm hoping that, that perhaps there will be a bit more of a, a middle way. It's, it's, the, it's the relaxation permitted development rights. So the, the, the biggest issue is, is when they will be able to convert, say, office space to housing without having to put any affordable element in and also not having to meet standards in terms of you know as, as Matt said they've dropped the zero carbon homes um, thing but it, it, it means there's a lot less um, influence that local authorities can exert over those sort of developments um, but I think we might see a little bit of movement on on that um, in the autumn as he said Thangham who's my neighbouring MP is doing a huge amount of work on, on this and uh, I think it's important to reach out to the local authorities as well, you know, conservative controlled local authorities as well as um, the conservative MPs. But, but that's all I'll say on that. I agree with him about uh, COP being postponed for a year. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew and Kerry, for your contributions. Um, I'm keen to move on to the panel and uh, talk about the report that we're obviously launching today. Um, thanks very much for your time, Matthew and, and, and Kerry. You're obviously welcome to, to stick around and listen to that second half. I'm very conscious that you're both very busy and it is a Sunday, so we won't be offended if you need to, uh, to head off to other events or spend time with your family. I'll, I'll stay for 20 minutes, but I've, I have got a shoot off because I've got a family thing, so I'll have to go at half three. Me too. No I'll, stay, I'll stay for 10, 15 more minutes. Then. Perfect.
Okay, great. So um, I am very keen, like I said, to to give each of our um, other panelists a couple of minutes just to quickly outline um, some of the things that they wrote about in their report. Um, first up, I want to move to Laura. Great. Thanks very much, Jack. And also want to say a massive thank you to Kerry and Matthew for um, providing us with all your thoughts around what needs to be done ahead of COP26. I think we can all agree that 2020 has been an incredibly turbulent year. In my contribution to the report, which is entitled Improving Education and Transparency Around the Climate Crisis, I focused on the need to make our future more egalitarian. This must be driven by an international commitment to tackling both climate and racial justice, as you cannot achieve one without the other. In order to do so, we need to ensure increased transparency around the delivery of stronger education around the climate crisis. This education needs to be focused on the intersectionality of the issues that means that the crisis we are facing will hit women, people of colour and poorer communities the hardest. One of the most valuable tools in the fight against climate change is education. First and foremost, we need to introduce educational reform to ensure environmental issues are taught and articulated effectively in schools from an early age. Subsequently, we need to utilise social media technology and sophisticated contemporary methods of communication to ensure that we're telling a more nuanced story about climate change and why immediate action is necessary. Finally, we'll need to create concrete routes to accountability for both each other and our politicians in addressing the significance of climate as an issue. This in turn will therefore engender clearer education in the future and a long-term shift in attitudes towards the climate crisis. It's also important that individuals, green campaigns, charities, organisations and people in politics step outside of their comfort zone more when we're talking about climate. We cannot keep preaching to convert it. More people need to challenge poorly formed beliefs and continue to hold environmentally damaging behaviours and opinions to account. My key policy recommendations that should be implemented ahead of COP26 will create a more sustainable future where we are transparent with ourselves and the next generation about the scale of the climate challenge facing us. They include compulsory climate education classes with improved education around biodiversity and the need for biodiversity net gain, including providing further access to nature. Intersectional climate crisis materials added to curriculums, which focus on environmental and social justice. Pressuring social media and media organizations to prevent the promotion of studies and theorists denying the climate crisis and raising awareness of the climate crisis through increased publicity and profile for green-friendly policies. A shared international commitment to facing down and telling the truth about climate crisis needs to start now for us to stand a chance of passing the environment on to the next generation in a better state than we found it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Laura. Um, We'll come to some Q&A once everyone has spoken, but Cecilia, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, thank you very much to everyone for coming and especially to you, Jack, Laura, our contributors, to Matthew for being here, his excellent foreword, and especially to Kerry for agreeing to come on such short notice. Um, I'm Cecilia, events officer for this network, uh, other co-editor and a regulatory policy manager. So I'm the author of the piece called Climate Change International Accountability. Um, I actually first had a comment on COP25, or as I call it, Corporate 25, because it was absolutely bankrolled by some of the biggest pollutants in the world. I mean, Spain's single biggest polluting company, Endesa, Iberdrola, both paying £2 million in diamond tier sponsorship. Then you've got Shell, BP, Billiton, BHP, any... NL, and that's not even an exhaustive list. So the question is, well, what, do you, what can we really achieve when the people and the companies who are the problem are presenting the solutions for us? So there's reform needed before we've even started in terms of kicking fossil fuel industries and companies out of COP26. So I wanted to give you a slightly different perspective on the climate crisis from my piece why it's not just an issue for us crusty left-wing anarchists, as Boris calls us, but an international human rights issue. So recently, we've seen reduction targets being repeatedly dismissed, 
documents referring to climate change redacted, environmental fines ignored, and many companies who are actually responsible for unprecedented levels of destruction, they don't even have environmental policy frameworks. As a result, as a very conservative estimate, 250,000 people a year are dying from climate change. UN Environment found that nearly one quarter of all deaths globally in 2012 could be attributed to modifiable environmental risks with a disproportionately high amount occurring in developing countries. So that's what makes climate change a human rights issue. From a legal perspective, a right to a healthy environment in various formulations is recognized by 118 countries. So I wanted to run you through five key policy recommendations uh, that are in my piece. So number one, the urgent need to recognize and record. Recognition is key to stopping and eliminating the problem that we have here. We know the lower estimation of, of people killed by avoidable environmental risks, 250K. So why are we not reporting this? Why are we not recording this? And why are we not recognizing it? There's a huge data gap when it comes to evidence on human fatalities from climate change. So we need to close that by putting climate change on death certification. That data is a catalyst for action. And then, and only then, can it really start to be addressed. Number two, accountability in terms of identification. Companies and people who fund projects that significantly contribute to the climate crisis and therefore to global deaths must be legally required to identify individuals responsible for those projects. Anonymity is one of the strongest facilitators of crime and the greatest defense against an invisible enemy is to label it. Individual people need to be named, their reputations put on the line, just as in a criminal case. And it's not just me who thinks this, we got consensus from Luke Pollard and Joe Blackman from Global Witness, who was mentioned earlier. Number three, a centralized international political effort to push back against three key elements. Destructive media framing, fake news and lack of reporting. The public isn't going to feel a sense of crisis if changing weather patterns or temperature increases as a result of climate change are reported as hottest summer on record. Get your bikinis out. If news outlets aren't covering this with commensurate urgency, the possibility of a change in paradigm rapidly retreats. Science denialism needs to be tackled with force. And those who are conspiracy theorists denying it need to have their platforms taken away. Number four, counteracting greenwashing. This is something I have a massive problem with. When companies disseminate dis disinformation to present an environmentally very responsible image of themselves, when actually that it's just business as usual behind closed doors. For example, BP launched a multi-million pound global advertising campaign, its largest in a, in a decade, to mislead customers into thinking it's transitioning to renewable energy, when in fact, more than 96% of its capital annual expenditure was still on fossil fuels. Even parliamentary pension funds are engangled in these kind of, these kind of investment webs, where you've got them benefiting from destructive environmentally, in, environmental problems and the companies that are causing them. So that brings me on to my last one. Five, destruction to actually equal divestment. When it comes to it, the new wave of activism is stemming from shareholders voting with their wallets. Divestment campaigns need to target guilty banks and corporations and shareholder activism needs to become the next consumer protest. Climate action is no longer confined to the direction given like to, by policymakers like me or MPs or parliament. It's everyone. As, as Kerry said earlier, we're complicit too. 
So it's now a social mo movement commanded by both economic and ethical imperatives. So to conclude, now more than ever, we need to reinvigorate our pursuit of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, invest in green transitions rather than resuscitating the fossil fuel industry, kick them out of COP26, and maintain diplomatic momentum to push for low carbon economies. So one, let's record deaths accurately to reflect climate change. Two, that was, that was close, I nearly swore at everyone. <laughs> Individuals and companies significantly contributing to climate change need to be identified. Three, we need to reframe how climate change is actually discussed and push back against science denialism. Four, sanction greenwashing. And five, divest from destruction. Thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. Um, if we move swiftly on to Alexander. All right. So my, my section of the pamphlet was fairly assigning responsibility based on historical emissions. Um, so basically what I was talking about is how we can assign responsibility on historical emissions, but also, um, well, what Helen is going to go into more detail on later in terms of con measuring responsibility for emissions by consumption rather than production. So it's easy to look at the world today and you think, well, who's producing the most? You know, China is the classic one. 27% of current emissions are Chinese. But that's not all the, the sort of the, the, work, the emissions that have been done. China's been sort of polluting on, a, on, a, on, a, on an industrial scale since about 1953, whereas we've been doing it since the 18th century. 13% of total emissions sort of over time is China. 25% is the US and 22% is the EU and the UK. On, the, on a longer time scale, we, we are the ones who've contributed more. So, so looking at the historical emissions is a really good way of looking at who's responsible for where we are now. And consumption, it's the other sort of half of my, of my article, is who is responsible for the emissions that we are making right now. In, the, in terms of the historical emissions, yeah, UK is, is only a constituent part of that 22%, but it matters who's doing it per capita. There are one point it was three a few years ago, it might be four now, billion Chinese. There aren't that many of us. The UK, in terms of per capita historical emissions, is second in the world. The only people worse than us are Luxembourg. And the fact that they would prefer to be known as a tax avoidance hub rather than a uh, large steel foundry, which is what a lot of the economy actually is, and is why they are so high up on the production emissions, is telling. The fact that we do measure, as, as those statistics are, by production means that what ends up happening is that we have effectively outsourced a lot of our emissions. So we still continue living a high, a high carbon lifestyle, we have a high carbon economy, but most of those emissions aren't produced in the UK. You know, there's, there's all sorts of talk about sort of post industrialization and the fact that sort of manufacturing has left, but those things still get made and we still consume those things, those, those goods, the, the trainers, the cars, whatever, they're still made and they're still polluting and we are still using them and we still buying them and we are still responsible for those emissions, but we don't get treated as responsible because they happen to be made across the channel. Well, and generally not just across the channel, but thousands and thousands of miles away in much less developed countries. We in the, in the sort of developed world have, have higher environmental standards generally, um, which you know, they've worked, they've made it a nicer place to be around us. But what ends up happening is those emissions still happen, it gets outsourced, we greenwash ourselves as countries. You know, having low em environmental standards becomes a competitive advantage. So countries in the developing world don't want to be poisoning their water and emitting vast amounts of pollutants. But what ends up happening is they have to because, well, we'll pay good money for it. And if they put up the environmental standards, they can't do it and someone else will. So that's not a fair way of doing it. You know, it's we are still the, the, the art, there's still the developed world's lifestyle that is, that is causing these emissions. If everyone in the world consumed a third as much as the average European, which is less than a third of the average Brit, because we are second in the world to, to consumption 
we'd be exactly the same place we are now. So if everyone in Europe had a third of the consumption that we have and the rest of the world was at a European level, same boat. That is how much we need to drop our, our consumption by. So the, at that level of, of sort of European and sort of developed consumption, it's not fair to measure by production. It's unjust and it's ineffective because it means that you don't affect a sort of impact the system that's actually causing these things. So Helen's going to be going into more detail um, from, from her pamphlet in terms of her article, terms of how to actually go about dealing with that. But that's, that's, that's my bit, why we should be measuring in these, these historical and consumption ways. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll now move on to Sebastian. Thank you very much. Uh, I contributed with the article titled uh, Open Source Solutions for Deforestation. So last month, a single wildfire in, uh, in the Amazon has claimed just 25,000 hectares of rainforest and released equivalent emissions through around 700,000 cars driven for one year. How do we protect our forests? Research has shown that to combat deforestation, we need two things. Implement policies to protect more forests and introduce financial incentives for local farmers and companies to produce more sustainably. However, because of a lack of resources, lax enforcement and poor data, these policies usually aren't that effective in practice. An open source data repository on the planet's forest would, in my opinion, solve the main challenges to our current deforestation strategy. Open source data refers to information that anyone can use, access, or distribute without any mechanisms of control or owners. Uh, think of something like Wikipedia. Data on forests has traditionally been within the domain of governments who control and often restrict access to that information. A free open source system, on the other hand, would also allow information to be accessed by individuals, the media, NGOs, and universities. This repository on forests would gather data using satellites from above, complemented by ground level data. The power of this system is that first information is democratized. Since there are no owners of this data, open source repositories have the potential to hold governments accountable and give local authorities the information they need to target their law enforcement efforts by, for example, opting to receive alerts on illegal deforestation in near real time. Completely transparent data means that there is no longer the secrecy surrounding what a government is doing in practice. The second benefit of the open source model is that much of the existing data on forests can be better utilized. It usually takes institutions like the UN several years to turn the data into a useful resource because of the time it takes to validate data. An open source model allows anyone to verify the data, meaning that information can be published practically in real time. It also helps make policies more effective as governments can implement sustainability programs backed by data. The key to conserving the planet's forests is to be able to hold countries, law enforcement, and companies to account. And using open source data and satellite technology, we can fight this environmental destruction. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then I will move on to Helen. Yeah. Hi, so as Alex already touched on a little bit, my report's called Aligning Responsibility with Consumption. Um, so I wrote my section of the report to answer the question, should we be looking at carbon consumption as well as carbon emissions when we talk about the effects of climate change? And I believe the answer to that question is yes. So in my opinion, too often when we talk about climate change and the effects of climate change, we ignore a lot of the carbon that's consumed by countries in the West that has adverse effects on countries in the global south. Um, that tends to be the way that balance goes. and. I think, well, I've proposed in my report what we need is a new scale to kind of redress that imbalance. So what I'm suggesting is a scale that looks at three factors. So one of them would be the amount of carbon consumed in a country. So not just the emissions that happen in that country, but emissions that happen in another country through things like manufacturing. So it might be factories that are producing goods for Western countries, the carbon that is consumed in that country would still count as carbon produced by Western countries as it's they're gaining the benefits, kind of the monetary benefits um, of that carbon. So that would be the first part of the kind of the responsibility scale. The second part would be um, how resilient countries are to the effects of climate change. So and then the third part would be how much um, and how badly affected countries are by climate change. So 
if countries like America, for example, produce lots of carbon in other countries that they're responsible for, they would go straight to the top of that carbon consumption scale. But where they'd be at the bottom is the effects that they actually see of climate change in their country might be quite low, um, but their kind of resilience to deal with it would be high. So what I would like to see the government do and what kind of policy change I'd like to see them do with this scale is match up countries that are least responsible for the effects of climate change but have the worst effects so those really badly affected that don't cause the problem would be matched with countries that do consume enormous amounts of carbon and see very little detriment in their own country um, so that kind of the richer western countries can support poorer countries in the global south with things like technology or education um, in order to support the effects of what is effectively their problem just so countries take on more responsibility for the carbon that's not just happened in their country but that's happening overseas and try and address that imbalance thank you great thanks very much helen for that and i will move on to amy hi um so the article that i wrote for this pamphlet makes the case that we need to ensure that climate change mitigation is based solely on scientific evidence and is not determined by political will or political agreements. And the importance that we need to hold governments to account on how well they meet climate change targets. So the summit has been postponed until November 2021, but this doesn't mean that we can put climate change mitigation on hold until then. It's important that we use the time until the summit to formulate a thorough and rigorous climate change agenda to ensure that the UN adopts the maximum temperature rise of 1.5 degrees. This needs to be imposed across the board because we can't afford to have certain states shirking their responsibility based on the prominence of climate change denialists within the countries. Um, so scientific analysis has concluded that it's vital that we need to set the limit as 1.5 degrees. Um, this is due to a general consensus in the scientific community that a temperature rise of 2 degrees would cause significantly more damage to the environment. The damage caused by a temperature rise of just 0.5 degrees is extensive and would cause um, significant species loss. This solidifies the need to set climate change restrictions according to expert advice and make sure that the input of countries who don't want to or, or who are more reluctant to contribute don't get a seat at the table. Um, so it's clear that it's going to be really difficult to meet these 1.5 degrees targets, but we need ambitious targets. We can't afford to have targets that are reached easily because it means that we're not going to be doing enough and that we won't be able to create changes in time. Um, so it means that we need to put pleasure measures in place to ensure that states are following these guidelines and meeting the deadlines, but also that we have initiatives in place to sort of reprimand states if they aren't meeting them, whether this is done through international organizations, through sanctions, or perhaps trade agreements. But it's really important that we do ensure that everyone's pulling their fair weight. It's not okay for certain countries to be doing it and not others we all need to share the burden fairly and so this is why it needs to be adopted by the UN as a central part of the UN climate change mitigation strategy. Amazing thank you and then finally but not least we'll go to Alex Titty. Cheers um, so in my chapter of the report I've discussed the need for an international commitment to climate migrants and the form that this should take uh, climate migrants are people whose lives are adversely affected by changes in their environment as a result of climate change and who must leave their homes, whether that's temporarily or permanently. Uh, these people are in the majority from the regions of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And from these regions alone, there'll be an estimated 143 million climate migrants by 2050. Patterns of migration mean that the vast majority of these migrants won't travel across the world, merely the shortest possible distance to escape the adverse effects of climate change. Therefore, these same regions are disproportionately impacted by climate induced and disaster events, will also bear the brunt of the financial burden of climate migration. So, I've argued that COP26 needs to be an opportunity to gain international commitment to supporting these regions, as well as the individuals and communities most impacted. I think it's a chance to address the glaring holes in the protection of climate migrants. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the global lack of preparedness and resilience in the face of disaster. And through learning lessons from this, we can prepare for the unavoidable growth in climate migration. I think the UN can address this through two channels. 
The first is through bolstering human rights legislation for climate migrants by expanding the rights of cross-border migrants, allowing them to claim refugee status. And the second channel is through the expansion of existing international protocol on climate migrants and on loss and damage. I think it needs to be updated to involve both liability and concrete compensation for climate change caused by loss and damage based on the polluter pays principle that has sort of been discussed by other authors here. It's only through concrete legal and financial commitment from UN member states that we can protect climate migrants at the present and future. I think both channels need to be implemented together so that the burden doesn't fall on regions which are worst hit by climate change, for example, where cross-border migration will be taking place without support in some form of financial aid from member states and other regions. I think climate migration is just one example of how important COP26 can be as a forum to accommodate international cooperation in the faces of challenges such as climate migration that simply can't be met and can't be overcome on a state-by-state -state basis. Thanks. Thank you to all of our contributors. Um, I'm very conscious of time. There are, um, I think, about five minutes left and quite a few panellists. Um, so I'm going to try and simplify all of the questions down uh, and simply ask, what do you all believe is the one thing that we can do as individuals to help mitigate climate change? Um, does anyone want to go first and try and answer that question? Um, I'd say really simply join an organisation. I mean, we're stronger together. Yes, there are things you can do in your own home with your own families, but joining an organisation, fighting for one common cause, campaigning, just grows the movement. So that's something you can do today and there are plenty of them to join. Uh, yeah, I'd add to that and say, if you're working, joining a union and sort of banding together to divest pensions, I think is the one sort of biggest power that we all have. Yeah, apart from those two suggestions, as suggested in my actual report, divestment. So really looking into the kind of places that the companies you're with, the banks that you're funding, what are they investing in and do you agree with it? So instead of thinking, you know, you have to campaign 365 days a year, just kind of spend your money as ethically and as responsibly as you possibly can. And of course, as we've seen, the general biggest thing that you can do to mitigate the effects of climate change is also to reduce your meat intake so i'm not saying go vegan today um great if you can but reduce it yeah i would, I would also echo that point about uh, meat intake just because so much of deforestation is either caused by clearing land for cattle to graze on or for the production of soy to feed them Yeah, I mean, in, in, on an individual level, it's quite difficult because obviously it's a s systemic problem. But um, yeah, uh, vegetarianism is, is a big one. Um, it's, if you can buy second hand, do. Um, basically, charity shops, second hand places, and like that, because there are those perfectly good things that aren't, aren't being used. You, no, no point in making another one. But again, systemic stuff, so vote, basically. Um, I'd agree with what everyone said. I think it's really hard to make changes on an individual level when it's such a huge problem. But I think like what Cecilia said about how you spend your money, not buying fast fashion and also like joining an organization, the, the more that we join together, the stronger our actions are essentially. Okay, I'm gonna cheat with my answer and say that the best thing that everyone can do to help climate change in the next three minutes is to go the next event that the Young Fabians are hosting at 4 p.m. Uh, and that is about trade unions and the green industrial revolution, the future of work in a green economy. And that is going to be hosted by none other uh, than Laura Hall, who is obviously one of our co-editors and was on this call up until about five minutes ago. Uh, so I'll just put that link in the chat. And if you are available at four o'clock, please do head over for what I'm sure will be another great event. Um, just a couple of final things for me. Thank you uh, again to um, Cecilia, um, and to Laura for co-editing um, the report and to obviously all of our contributors. Um, a couple of them couldn't be here today, but you can read their reports um, in that published document now. 
Um, if any of you are young members of the Labour Party, or indeed young members are not members of the Labour Party, but you're keen to get involved in the Young Fabians, please do. Uh, we're constantly hosting lots of Zoom events um, or physical events uh, prior to March. Uh, we have about a dozen different policy networks, obviously across environment, health, economy, and many others. Um, and we have got a lot of engagement from across the Labour Party. So um, please do find us on Facebook, on Twitter, get involved. Thank you all for attending and I hope to see you at the next event at four o'clock. Thanks. Thanks everyone.